and in both you have hyper osmolar and uh, low osmolar and uh, in non ionic you have again iso osmolar and low osmolar so comparison of the iodinated contrast media how you going to compare it uh, you can uh, divide this into the monomer and dimer this both have ionic non ionic again ionic and non ionic you will see uh, the osmolarity of monomers are more rather than dimer so on the basis of these parameters they are divided into uh, the ionic and non ionic the iodine content milli osmolar per kg and the osmolarity type a hyper osmolar contrast media you can see low osmolar contrast media and isomer in which we see it should be water soluble chemically and it should be heat stable it, it should be biological inert means non anti antigenic it should have low viscosity and have low or also osmolar it should be excreted from body and selectively especially through the kidneys it should be safe and in that so what are the hazards why it's dangerous for us so you will know that uh, it can lead to hypersensitivity reactions and it will cause thyroid dysfunction it can uh, uh, produce a uh, kidney damage and lot of other tissue body reaction as well so condition associated with adverse especially in those conditions which are already uh, affecting the kidney or had got a previous uh, reaction history of anaphylactic reaction a history of uh, any reaction to food or any uh, medication and uh, have multiple medical problems and especially a treatment with nephrotoxic drugs especially aminoglycosides and since and what should have advanced age this also uh, lead to the adverse reactions this is a busy slide very i hope like but is very important so the categories of acute reaction the uh, you can divide into mild moderate and severe reactions hypersensitivity and chemotoxic these are the two effects of the contrast agent which lead to uh, kidney damage it's a in mild form we can manage conservatively but in severe form we have to be very careful because it leads to anaphylactic reaction laryngeal spasm facial edema and hypotension we have to treat very vigorously so hypersensitivity reaction why it will occur because of the excipients they may important role in the iodinated contrast media hypersensitivity especially the sodium calcium adenate and is an excipient of both ionic and non ionic trial in chemotoxic reactions they are frequently dependent on dose and concentration but the uh, the hypersensitivity doesn't depend upon dose and concentration this is very important so this is only this is slide but it's only to show you the skin test and allergy test can be done to see whether these contrast are important to causing the skin fact skin test and the this uh, allergic test is very important to see how you we will manage this uh, contrast induced nephropathy or other reactions so we have two pathophysiologies of uh, uh, this reaction uh, one is the immediate hypersensitive non immediate hypersensitive reactions you are they uh, are since they will damage they will cause lot of reactions in the body and if it's in mild form we have to just observe and monitor with uh, with the uh, we will treat with uh, hydration and other things as to receptor antagonist form we use epinephrine and other things if it's a uh, only minor uh, articaria we have no histamine sometimes you will we may give epinephrine and uh, simetadine which is s2 receptor antagonist and the if, if it develop bronchospasm that is very important you have to give oxygen and you will see it is mild form moderate form or severe form in this category you have two lot of drugs to give but antihistamine and uh, in this category you have to use corticosteroids and consider s2 at the another form of uh, reaction is a facial or laryngeal, laryngeal edema that is very also important uh, you can call in this condition to anesthesia people because you have to 
intubate the patient and sometimes it may lead to stomach as well. And in mild form you have to give epinephrine, in moderate to severe form you have to give epinephrine and other things. In addition to this, antihistamines and steroids uh, and optional H2 receptor blockers. So if it hypotension develops, what have you have to do? In a simpler form, it's a, I think very small slide. I'm sorry, it's not, uh, you are not uh, realizing clearly. Just to show you the, in, a, in simpler form, okay, hypotension, if it's a mild, you have to uh, the, follow the basic rules. If it's associated with bradycardia, routinely we give atropine and uh, other things. If it's associated with tachycardia, it means it's an anaphylactic reaction. You have to be very careful about it. In hypertensive crisis, follow the same ABC rule, uh, preserve IVSAs, monitor vitals, and uh, see the pulse oximeter about oxygen saturation, and give oxygen through mask, and sometimes you have need labutolol IV in fion form, and uh, sometimes you can give nitroglycerin, uh, and sometimes you need IV furosemide to counter this condition. So when pulmonary edema occurs, same, follow the same rules, preserve IVSS, monitor the vitals, give oxygen by mask, and you should monitor the oxygen saturation, elevate bed of, head of bed if possible, and furosemide is another option you have. So contrast nephropathy, that's very important for us. We are using a lot of dye in our routine practice. So contrast nephropathy refers to a reduction in renal function after the administration of iodinated contrast agent that is routinely used. The standard diagnostic criteria for contrast nephropathy is greater than 25% increase in baseline serum creatinine concentration within three days of receiving an intracontrast agent. Other possible causes have been ruled out. So serum creatinine will usually peak within three to seven days, mostly it returns to baseline within 14 days. So course is usually benign, but it could be different. How it can prolong the hospital stay time, increase the need of dialysis, and increase overall mortality. So what is pathophysiology of contrast-induced nephropathy? Uh, you will see there are two main uh, 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 things. One is the renal vasoconstriction. Sorry. One is a renal, a renal vasoconstriction, second one is the cytotoxic effects of the contrast media. This is an imbalance between the vasodilators and uh, constructors which uh, leads to uh, the medullary hypoxia. Medulla is very sensitive area of the kidney and can lead to the ischemia and tubular necrosis. In this way it leads to the, uh, the uh, contrast nephropathy. In this way the cytotoxic effects of contrast media it will, it will uh, generation of reactive oxygen species and apoptosis of renal cells can also lead to the uh, contrast induced nephropathy. So what are the risk factors of contrast induced nephropathy? We can divide into two. One is the patient related risk factors. Second is the procedure related risk factors. So in uh, uh, patient related risk factors, you have already renal impairment. If someone has diabetic nephropathy, if someone has CCF or he is already dehydrated, if he has advanced age, anemia, concurrent use of nephrotoxic drugs, known or suspected acute, acute kidney injury. So these all are the patient-related risk factors for developing uh, contrast in nephropathy. But if uh, related to procedure, the intraarterial administration, if, if you use high osmolality contrast media, and large do doses of the contrast media. This can all lead to contrast-induced nephropathy. So why uh, contrast-induced nephropathy does not occur in all? Because it depends upon the systemic and renal circulation. Uh, if it's a normal uh, renal status and other things, you won't have this condition. But renal medulla already I quoted is a very sensitive uh, to hypoxia. It can lead to the uh, kidney damage, acute kidney damage. So, so when there is a disruption of between vasoconstriction and vasodilatation, so it can lead to kidney injury. So you can categorize uh, the uh, contrast nephropathy uh, severity and there are various grades for this. 
the if you uh, see the grade zero and uh, uh, the uh, uh, creatinine level is less than 0.5 mg per deciliter above baseline the major advanced cardiovascular events is about 19% mortal is uh, about 10% if is a grade 2 and you have serum creatinine more than 0.5 mg per deciliter above baseline the major advanced cardiac events is about 28% and mortality is around 30%. This is very significant. So that is another score which is a very popular Mehran risk score for the contrast induced nephropathy. You will predict the uh, future contrast induced nephropathy by uh, discussing this Mehran risk score factor. Uh, in this day, if someone has risk factors is about, uh, you can give him 5 score. If an intratrial balloon pump is used, you have another 5 score. If someone has some congestive heart failure, 5 score. If age is more than 75 years, another 4 score. So in this way, there are various parameters. You can see easily these are the various parameters. If you use a, a 100cc, you have one risk factor. And if a serum creatinine is more than 1.5 mg per deciliter, you have 4 score. So you have to calculate and you will predict if a risk score is less than 5, the, the risk of contrast in nephropathy is 7.5% and the risk of dialysis is about 0.04%. If you calculate the risk score of any patient in between 6 to 10, the, four, the chance of contrast in nephropathy is 7.5%. But the risk of dialysis is again 0.04%. Uh, and when the uh, Mehran risk score is uh, between 11 to 16, you have risk of uh, contrast nephropathy is about 26 percent. The uh, risk of dialysis now becomes double, more than 1 percent. If uh, the risk is uh, the Mehran risk score is more than 16, uh, you have the chance of uh, contrast nephropathy is about 57 percent, and the risk of dialysis is about 12 percent. So this Mehran risk score is very important. We should know about this. This is another some busy slide, but very important. This is a flow chart. You will see this flow chart. Uh, the patient risk assessment and management of contrast-induced acute kidney injury. The, if this is again based on the Mehran risk score. Okay? These are the parameters of the Mehran risk score. If you have again the less less than five score of Mehran, you have only treat with oral or R. IV hydration. If it is an intermediate between the 6 to 10, the con you have to modify the risk factors, treat or prevent peri, peri procedure hypotension, correct anemia, suspend nephrotoxic drugs, monitor creatinine daily, and avoid multiple procedures in 48 to 72 hours. If Mehran score is very high, so you should uh, eval uh, evaluate alternate procedure without contrast media because it is very dangerous, it can lead to contrast in nephropathy and dialysis. So um, if you want to give pro, uh, fluid, you can give one, uh, crystallite with 1.5 1, 1, 1 mg per kg per hour, 3 to 12 hours before and 12 to 24 hours after the procedure. Okay, And you have to use the low osmolar or isoosmolar contrast media. That is our ideal contrast agent. And minimize the volume of contrast media and you can use uh, n acetyl cysteine, although it's now not recommended, and uh, hydration is most important. Another study was a uh, posidon trial we missed in the slides. This is a very important uh, trial which uh, will help us to predict the contrast in nephropathy, how you will give the fluid in these patients, and it will decrease the uh, chances of uh, sin in patient about 60%. So we missed the audition trial. The another remedial trial was used, which will on uh, sodium bicarb along with IV fluid and n acetyl cysteine was superior to administer simply fluid and uh, an acetyl cysteine alone or in combination with lamarcelline, ascorbic acid, and n acetyl cysteine. And it will prevent the contrast-induced acute kidney injury at low to medium risk. This was the remedial trial one. But in two, they have used ferrosamide and justified this use by results of the Prince trial. So this is another study which will compare with the iso-osmolar non-anic dye with the low-osmolar non-anic dye. They are 
less or more with comparable results no significant so another part of my topic that is the radiation hazards there is another important topic but very rough so radiation is bad we all know that what you can't see can hurt you so if you put your fingers under radiation you will have such type of changes with the passage of time so what are the types of radiation so radiation has uh, two types ionizing radiation and non ionizing radiations if you see the ionizing radiation which have particle beams uh, in 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 this slide you will see the alpha particle beta particle and gamma particle these are the very important particle beams they are charged particles they are ionizing radiation they cause they cause hazards to the body and another is a uncharged particle beam that you have this among them neutron beam is very important because it produces in nuclear reactors and in non ionizing which is routinely used in our homes like microwaves infrared electric waves ultraviolet rays these are the commonly used in our homes this also lead to radiation hazards in them these are some facts by the international commission on Radi radiological protection recommend that use of effective dose to evaluate the effect of partial exposure and relate to this to the risk of equivalent whole body exposure as uh, this slide you will see the cyber units are equal to 1 gray unit uh, one gray unit sorry is equal to 0.7 cyber unit this is the scale we are using in a, our setup so modern cardiology procedures you know as uh, the pci and other angiographies we use effective dose of uh, milli cyberts uh, for a angio it is 4 to 21 but in pci it is about 9 to 29 milli cyberts respectively the intensity of the biological effect of x rays depend on the absorbed dose uh, of the sensitive tissues and expressed in gray units the average dose per procedure for the cardiologist is estimated as 0.05 milligram this one to to allow better comparison of patient staff doses this value can be expressed as dose area product that is called dap dap is calculated as the product of dose of air in a given plane the area of radiation beam and is independent of the distance from the x ray source so coronary angiography pci approaches the procedure mean patient dap in the range of 20 to 106 uh, gray Centimeter square to 44 to 143 gray centimeter square respectively. So another some facts about the radiation. The recent uh, evidence suggests that even protected low dose ex radiation exposure could be associated with leukemia, carotid artery atherosclerosis, and early vascular aging. This is very important. Physicians need to keep the dose as low as reasonably available. So two X-ray exposure parameters: flow time and cumulative uh, karma area product which is called cap this is very important in all uh, shows us to decrease the radiation because it will leads to your body hazards so cumulative cap which is a product of cumulative air karma a layer of dose intensity and image intense support area reflecting the volume of exposed tissue is the best measure of the total quantity of radiation that impacts on the patient during procedure i know this is a very rough topic but i am very sorry so how how you going to spare the uh, yourself from radiation these are the sparing factors minimize fluoroscopic time in acquisition time modulate the fluoroscopic dose per frame to the minimum that provide adequate image detail for the study purpose decrease the radiation detector magnification and reduce field size by collimation and decrease the framing there these are the four tactics in this way you can prevent yourself and your patient as well so recommended dose limit in plain radiation exposure what are this uh, is a this is for occupational like our medical staff doctors others this is for the public and um, for the uh, common public effective dose for occupation is a 20 milli sievert per year average over defined period of 5 years and for public it is 1 milli sievert in a year so annual equivalent dose in a, uh, uh, it should be in for the i it should be less than 150 for occupational for public it should be less than 15 milli sievert for skin is a 500 and for hands and feet it is about 
milli sawat units so these are the hazards of the radiation on our body you will see from the head to toe it affect our body with vigorously in eyes it can uh, lead to the cataract formation in thyroid it can cause cancer in lungs it leads to lot of uh, dna mutation and lead to lung cancer uh, in stomach especially if we inhale that uh, radiation it will lead to stomach problems and these uh, reproductive organs are very sensitive to radiation it can lead to sterility that's very important and skin has a cause the hydrogen uh, cause reddening and burning of the skin bone marrow is very common to lead leukemia so in the right side of this slide you will see okay, if it is a high risk patient what are the moderate risk patient and what are the uh, tolerable levels so in this category we have to keep ourselves but if you increase the radiation dose you will increasing your uh, um, hazards so in this you will see that if it is a dose more than 2000 milli sievert it will uh, cause fatal conditions in your body uh, and if you have a moderate risk in which there is no immediate symptom but increase uh, risk of serious illness later in your life but if in, in, in this category which is a tolerable and we have to keep ourselves in this category it's uh, only uh, it has no symptoms and no detectable increased uh, level of cancer in the later life you should keep yourself below 20 milli sievert okay and these are the various recommendations for uh, if you are using the ct scan routinely you have using at least 10 milli sievert so uh, and in single mammogram you have 3 milli sievert exposure to radiation uh, these are the numbers which is exposed to radiation and these are numbers which is not exposed to radiation you will see okay, this is a control group and a year affection this is a 16 to 15 than 60 years. So when you expose lot of radiation for long time, you will have lot of problems in the later in your life. So how to prevent? That is the big question for us. We have to deal with this seriously. Said what things we want to do to protect yourself, and what things you do to protect your patient as well. So for patient, you increase table height, very uh, beam angle and keep extremities out of beam. For operator, you have to protect garment, wear protective garments, increase distance from source and optimize the shielding, keep body parts out of beam and the cath lab should be robotic. And this, this center is for both. A limit radiation usage, decrease sleeve use, minimize speed angles, keep detector close to patient, decrease frame rate, so these are the things we can do in our routine practice. So this is a very important shielding uh, cath lab. The ideal cath lab you have to keep detected close to patient. Polymer the system when you taking the films. Position between shield and uh, between patient and operator should be uh, should have a shield in between them. And radiation safety cap you have to wear this. Radiation safety glasses with side panel you have to wear this. And these are the lead skirt and vest with thyroid collar. You have to wear the thyroid collar. And if the, the lead skirt in between patient and operator should be movable, so we can protect ourselves. So radiation, what is the radiation shielding? These are in the, in the form of lead caps, gloves, eyewear. We already know that uh, uh, the radiation can cause brain tumor as well. So we have to protect our brain. And uh, if you wear the lead caps, we will decrease 90% radiation dose and uh, about uh, 125 gram and are comfortable to wear. And uh, this uh, lead cap has weight of 125 gram. So you have to protect your hand with wearing the lead gloves. And you have to uh, wear the uh, uh, related glasses. This also decreases 98% radiation. And if you non lead glasses, uh, reduce the radiation dose by 36%. So see the lead medable eyewears are more, very important rather than non lead These are another protection device for us. You can wear a wearable apron which is custom fit apron is recommended. And uh, 
Large debt can increase radiation exposure to breast and tissues women. Uh, so nowadays, uh, the, they made a, a, a apron lead which are lighter than the heavier previous uh, aprons which was about 7 kg. Now they decrease up to 30% and their weight is now 4 kg. Because it can cause a lot of back aches and back problems, so you have to uh, use a custom fitted aprons. So now they are making a bismuth based material which are good. And ceiling mounted sheets you can use in this way, you can reduce your radiation and you can wear a thyroid collar because it can lead to thyroid cancer. You have to wear this and avoid the thyroid cancer. So table lead skirts should you use because it decreases the radiation dose to a, a operator. Patient drapes are very important to prevent scatter radiation to the operator. So this is recommended. Another protection uh, system is the zero gravity radiation protection system. In this, this is a ceiling suspected density system is available to support walk and lead. This is a very important uh, line suit. These are the suits uh, that eliminates the weight of lead aircraft. We let uh, aircraft have a one millimeter lead equivalently from the higher to grand. So, I think time is very important. Another system is egg nest uh, radiation protection. You can see these are the shields we can use and in this way we can prevent ourselves and our patient as well. This egg nest x-ray is a carbon uh, fiber cell platform with flexi flexible shielding for radiation protection. If we come uh, convert to the patient body, allow 360 degree of dentary motion. So this is a very important slide. Uh, how you going to monitor the radiation dose? The personal dosimeters are the gold standard to measure the dose of radiation to the operator. We have two dosimeters. You can uh, we, uh, you can keep this uh, uh, dosimeters uh, at the thyroid collar or under the protective apron. In this way, you can monitor the dose of radiation. And we are usually done in our cat lab and ICD. So this is another system for the shortage of time. So in Tanculian, in last two decades, you have seen the continuous increase in the frequency of diagnostic and interventional cat radiation. Yes, it is paramount that radiation protection cathode must be a matter of concern. In addition, this interventional cardiologist must realize that their, uh, their patients are becoming increasing their awareness. They are questioning to us uh, how you are going to prevent us from radiation and other things. So, step measures should be taken to avoid any unnecessary uh, radiation. Explore not only to medical staff but also the patient. And uh, we should have local guidelines and precautions to prevent radiation hazard and we should uh, develop our local guidelines. As we know that the effect of radiation exposure not occurring immediately but long term consequences can be serious. Immediately we don't have uh, the effects but in long term we can have a lot of serious problems in the future. So education on radiation hazards, safety and its prevention is badly needed. Training and awareness in this direction is equally important. Thank you. Any questions?